Hello, my name is Julia Yang. I'm a fifth year graduate student in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at UC Berkeley. Today, I'll be talking on the thermodynamics of spinel-like cation partial ordering in ultra-high power and energy density lithium-ion batteries for fast charging electric vehicles. Disordered rock salt, or DRX materials, are a sustainable solution for the growing demand of cobalt needed through 2030. This perspective, published by Elsa Olivetti out of MIT, looked, in, looked at two scenarios, low demand and high demand for cobalt, and found that for the low demand case, the necessary cobalt supply was 100, is 160% of the world refinery capacity in 2016. And a lot of the, the uh, demand actually comes from this blue, as you can see, which is the automotive battery industry. And in the high demand case, we get to 280% of the world refinery capacity in 2016. So a lot of growth is needed from various sectors like direct cobalt mining or byproduct cobalt mining when you mine for copper or nickel, as well as unscheduled sources and this secondary purple bar, which is um, uh, techniques like recycling cobalt. So either a lot of cobalt is a lot of cobalt growth is needed and that we can we should be mining for a lot of cobalt or we are very interested in cobalt free solutions and that's where drx materials are critical for us in addition drx materials don't require this layered structure that typically lithium cold oxide or nnc family is required and that affords us a lot of design flexibility so in the gray hkl plane the 111 you can see that lithium vacancies order and they don't mix with the blue planes, which are where the trans transition metals occupy. If you have any kind of disordering, that results in a lower lithium diffusivity and a poor electrochemical performance. In these rock salt-like structures, you actually don't require any layeredness. And that means you can put any transition metal in your material that is octahedral and needs to occupy um, in a one-to-one -one ratio with the lithium the A1B1 rock salt ratio, and that's all you need for making these cathodes. So this requires much less, and you can use many more chemistries in the CRX family. DRX also contains these orange tetrahedral interstitial, interstitial sites, where a commonly known example is lithium manganese oxide, LiMN204, which occupies one eighth of all of the all of the tetrahedral sites, and this is the spinel structure. The spinel-like low-temperature lithium cobalt oxide structure, LiCO2 here, occupies an ordered octahedral arrangement, and this um, is known as spinel-like. So you have much flexibility in this rock salt space when you also consider occupying these tetrahedral sites. And why you want to occupy these tetrahedral sites actually was found recently to um, be for this reason, which is that you can actually get ultra-high rate capabil capability. And this is the stoichiometry they tested. So Li 1.68, manganese 1.6, O 3.7, and fluorine 0.3 is a spinel-like material. Um, and I highly recommend you check out the Jan Tide presentation, which goes over the fantastic electrochemical performance um, of this material and other, other material um, at various cycling rates. And if you notice, you can clip at three volts and get still two, over 200 milliamp hours per gram specific capacity. And clipping at two volts, gets you over 300 million hours per gram. So this partially ordered material is quite unusual. And we think this fantastic uh, rate capability comes from the unusual arrangement of the Spinel-like composition, which is the departure from typical lithium excess DRX materials. Here I'm showing this bar chart-like explanation for how you can understand the novelty of the Spinel material. See that the lithium and cobalt in layered, uh, this layered lithium cobalt oxide material occupies a one-to-one -one ratio um, with the oxygen and all vacancies on the tetrahedral site, which is in gray. The lithium excess class has an excess of lithium that's disordered, denoted by this dotted pattern here. It also incorporates a charge compensator in brown, which is typically a heavier element compared to the redox metal. This is in purple and that's uh, cobalt free. So you still have this A1B1 ratio here and you have no occupancy of the vacancies. That are tetrahedral. In this spinel-like composition, you actually have lithium in some tetrahedral sites, and you have vacancies in the octahedral sites. So this cation arrangement is quite unusual, and we think that's the reason for why this material has such 
unprecedented high rate for a disordered structure. And so for simulations, this LMOF3 phase actually requires much advances in our typical training, model selection, and sampling approaches for these three reasons, high component, disordered, and cathode. I want to first focus on the disordered component, which is that a disordered material requires large unit cells um, to capture the long range and short range phenomenon, which means that we must use a coarse grading approach to calculate the energies of these systems via this lattice model cluster expansion method. A cluster expansion is an expansion of the system energy on its configuration. And some examples of this cluster expansion in battery cathodes is in calculations of average voltage curves. Lithium vacancy disordering um, energies are important, and you can use a cluster expansion to get that. You can also use cluster expansion to calculate solubility limits. So if you wanted to dope fluorine on your lattice and you want to compare the differences between the manganese oxide system with the chromium oxide system, let's say, you would look at where the order disorder transition is for various composition of fluorine in your material, and then you can compare which material can incorporate fluorine more. And so another example you can use cluster expansion is to uh, look at statistically the short range order in different example cathodes. So here is lithium manganese titanium oxide and lithium manganese zirconium oxide, which have the same lithium content and metal content, but they have very different lithium diffusivities. And Monte Carlo simulations, here are snapshots of some examples, show that the chemical effects result in different short range ordering and therefore different lithium connectivity, which is in green. And we had to use up to around 1,000 atoms to really see this difference in the short range ordering. So that's why we are motivated to use the cluster expansion to understand this disordered system. The high component is complicated. We, because we have, for example, on the octahedral site, five species, lithium, manganese two, manganese three, manganese one, the vacancy, when they come together to create this very familiar four octahedral cluster, this is incredibly important when understanding diffusion in this Dirac space. So altogether, this is combinatorially five to the four configurations you would need to get without consideration of symmetry um, that you need to sample. So as a result, you need multiple hundreds of initial calculations to ensure that you are sampling all kinds of cation configurations for your model um, to have information on that energy. So this space is very complex. And the space being complex also results in having a very wide feature matrix, many more features P than the training data N, um, which requires compressive sensing to avoid overfitting. But the compressive sensing on this space is not immediately obvious because there is actually a structure within your feature matrix. As you can see, alpha 1 is a structure of, it's a group, alpha 2 is a group because they're different clusters by theory. And so compressive sensing by uh, banging this kind of hierarchy is, has proved to be especially important for our purposes. And the last example of this space being a high component is that we, during sampling, need to include other kinds of reactions and go straight away from the typical canonical sampling slots that, that uh, maintain composition. So manganese 3 being able to react in form manganese 2 and 4 is a really important reaction for us to include. The last complication of the system being cathode is that we have charges and we have charge balancing requirements. For a typical procedure we have done, um, we have looked at the magnetic moment of the manganese and assigned the oxidation state to the manganese according to the ideal case, which is looking at the magnetic moment for the manganese oxide, pure manganese oxide. But as you can see, for 84 structures, employing this static cutoff via ideal cases results in 39 structures which are not charge balanced, which is a very inefficient way to, to gather data. But if you use a Bayesian optimized approach, which seeks to maximize the objective function to, which is the, the total charge in a structure, uh, maximize the number that are charge balanced specifically, then you actually get 23 structures which are charge balanced. And so you can get a much better way of data collection if you optimize how you're assigning your data, uh, your charges. The, other part of this being a cathode being uh, complicated is that we have intense structure relaxations, which for our purposes of being a fixed lattice model is important to, to remap back properly. One example of this um, reason, uh, one, one way this can be relaxed is that the manganese three plus ion is a Jan Teller ion, which 
highly distorts to lower its energy. This axial bond is 2.17, and the other bond here is 1.97. So locally, this octahedron distorts because it wants to lower the or eliminate the electronic degeneracy, the d degeneracy. And so this local distortion causes relaxations, which are hard to map. Another example, another example of relaxations is that a phase sharing interaction, manganese 2 plus, with a lithium tetrahedral ion here, causes the lithium ion to actually fall a little bit further away from its center. And so the connectivity is still maintained if you map the structure with respect to its anion framework. Notice that it's still phase sharing octahedral with tetrahedral. However, the fact that these lithium ions fall a little bit away from the center is a non-trivial problem for a structure mapping. You wanna be rigorous and specific, but you also want to catch these edge cases. And so we've had to develop advances to get better structure mapping methods. So um, as far as simulations go, the space is incredibly complex and has required us to take a really hard look at how we typically approach cluster expansion modeling of high component cathode systems. And so this is really important for all the reasons I mentioned before that DRX is a technology for the future, for sustainability, for Michelle design, and for high rate. Having these techniques to understand the space quantitatively and specifically is a very important tool for us. And so now I'll go into how I use this quickly for the LMOF3 system. I first calculate scan DFT calculations, and then I fit to a cluster expansion model, which has disorder over the octahedral site, the tetrahedral site, and the anion site. And I solve for these coefficients, J0, J alpha, and then the coefficient for the long-range electrostatic AWOL term, which we have found is an important inclusion for our ionic systems. And once we calculate these coefficients, we can fit systems with much larger uh, atoms, many more atoms. In this case, I'll be showing results for a cell that is 2000, that has 2,560 atoms. And with the canonical Monte Carlo sampling, I can do structure analysis for these kinds of cluster configurations, this lithium-lithium phase sharing interaction. And then I can also analyze these structures for percolation and connectivity, so accessible lithium accessible sites, to understand what are the metal arrangements which govern high rates. As far as these materials are synthesized, how they're synthesized, they're high energy ball mills for 450 RPM for 25 hours and then cycled at room temperature. Theoretically, we don't know what ball milling does to the material, and so the closest way we can try and understand the experimentally uh, created structure is to look for conditions that try and simulate this synthesis by looking for the occupancy to match. Um, sorry, so that looks at the, so I'm showing here the Monte Carlo energy with respect to the cation occupancy, showing the cation occupancy for tetrahedral lithium in green, octahedral lithium in gray, the manganese octahedral in purple, and then the orange fluorine content. And so the dotted lines are the experimentally refined occupancies, and we can get as close as we can to the dotted line by sampling at the energy range band in pink. And we call this the relevant sampling range E star for understanding LMOF3. The first cluster we care about actually is this lithium-lithium phase sharing interaction. You can analytically calculate this interaction by looking at the correlation function of the specific cluster you care about. So in this case, if we're looking at the octahedral lithium, then we do um, one over M, where M is the number of cations that can occupy the octahedral site to the first power because we have one, one site. And we multiply that with this one plus summation, the configuration matrix for this cluster octahedral site times the correlate correlation vector uh, values of that octahedral site. And then we um, have the values for the octahedral cluster. If we care about the phase sharing interaction, then you take products of them. And then now we're, now we're calculating with respect to the random limit, and that's at 10,000 Kelvin. What we find is that the lithium-lithium phase sharing interactions occur with very high probability close to the random limit, 1.0. And this interaction was found to be important in a spinel system the anode, um, the Li4 lithiated to Li7 uh, titanium oxide anode, and having these phase sharing interactions appear resulted in these low barrier hops, which 
could explain the high charging rate in these materials. I also recommend that you go see Tina Chen's presentation where she will go over the calculations to explain this uh, phenomena that has baffled the community. Um, but the fact that we see a lot of lithium, lithium phase sharing for a long time, I'm oh, sorry, uh, in this material also is interesting because it has also high rate. And so the last question I want to answer is percolation. Do these structures even percolate lithium? And what actually is the connectivity? How many sites are accessible if it is percolating? We frame this question by assuming that lithium can only hop with channels that are not phase sharing with any manganese metals. So only 0TM hops are allowed. This looks like for the octahedral hops, the cluster, the four octahedral cluster can only be lithium or vacancy. And then for the tet oct tet hop, you can only face share with eight vacancies or lithium. And the, so the zero TM channels are now represented for this structure in the next slide. The green are the zero TM sites, and the yellow shows the connectivity of these zero TM sites if the zero TM sites are one hop away. And that is denoted as this lithium vector or like lithium network. So to understand if the structure percolates lithium, this condition has to be satisfied, which is that there must exist a point in this network such that this point is one hop away from the periodic image of the initial point R0. One hop being 1.81 angstroms in our fixed lattice model. This condition is satisfied for the structure, and therefore the structure is percolating. I'm plotting, I'm showing here now the yellow polyhedra percolating network back with the manganese and anions. And we can calculate the ratio of how many polyhedra we have with, with respect to all of the cation sites, octahedral plus tetrahedral. And we find that this ratio is 13%. So 13% of all of our cation sites are accessible. They are percolating. If we do this analysis for all of our structures, we do an average over the Monte Carlo structures for the zero TM sites, and then we add up all the possible percolating networks. So in the previous one, I showed one, one example, but if you have multiple percolating networks, we have to add up all those sites. I'm showing you here what it looks like for all different temperatures with respect to now uh, still all the cation sites. So it turns out that all of our structures across temperature are percolating, all of our structures have that condition being satisfied. And the green bar is the number of zero TM sites. As you can see, there's very little difference across temperature in the total number of zero TM sites. Meaning that if you have manganese being tetrahedral or octahedral, you still get pretty much the same number of zero TM. What you get differently is this yellow bar, which is the percolating sites, and that's the lithium network vector that I showed earlier. It seems that metal disorder, which is more disordered at 5,000, less disordered at 400, controls not the number of zero TM sites, but it controls the number of percolating sites, the fraction of total accessible sites or accessible lithium if you end up putting in lithium. And if we compare this E star data with our experimental first charge and first discharge, we find that this should compute to roughly 0.32 accessible lithium per four anions. In experiments, what they see is actually 0.50 accessible lithium, which gets us not quite to the content before they see oxygen redox. And so this is actually typical of our simulations where we typically under predict the capacity. Um, and if we make additional assumptions such as that lithium that are that are in one TM channels are which are a few hops away from the percolating network are also accessible, then that may explain the difference between the simulations and the observed capacity. So what is becoming apparent though is that all of these metal deficient disordered rock salt materials can percolate, but they have different capacities. At low temperatures you have the lowest accessible lithium content. Um, and you go to higher temperatures with more manganese disorder, you get more accessible lithium. And so some conclusions for today are that first, we needed to develop extensive advances in cluster expansion approaches on multi-component cathodes to start understanding them at the level, um, at their level of their complication. We have found that lithium, lithium phase sharing features are very close to the random limit. Um, and we've also found that it is feasible, definitely, to percolate 
in this stoichiometry without lithium excess, possibly due to the fact that we have manganese deficiency. Manganese disorder has little effect on the total number of zero TM channels, but it does control the fraction of the percolating sites in yellow. The greater the manganese disordering, the higher the fraction of accessible sites of the accessible lithium. We need to do more comparison with the experimental refinements to really start to understand what are the cation arrangement, arrangements which set the high rate in this partially ordered spinel-like novel space. So with that, I'd like to thank my mentor, Professor Gerrit Sater and collaborator Gerrit Sater. He was the one that gave me this tough project, but I really much, much look forward to answering all more questions. Um, it's a fascinating, fascinating uh, new class of materials. I also want to thank the Sater group of members and alumni with special thanks to Tina Chen, Louise Rosa Luke, and Zinab Jadidi, who are my fellow theory friends and grad students, also working on tough but interesting projects. And I also want to thank Dr. Daniel Kachev and Professor Rafael Clement for working with me in the beginning parts of this project. Um, and for anyone listening and interested in battery theory, I recommend these select references for a good introduction to cluster expansion theory, and then also look at all of the useful applications of cluster expansion to, uh, to battery systems. So I would like to take any questions at this time. Thank you.